but Oblab has definitely created something that is mobile, wireless, uh, connects to a tablet, and can be used very easily. Um, so comparative pricing structures, but really like moving towards what you would expect out of a wearable. And the point that I wanted to make on this video is that is a hundredfold price reduction, which is huge. Examples that have been gleaned from using their near-infrared spectroscopy device. Uh, they've developed new lasers, they've developed new sensors, they've developed uh, ultrasound technology that creates interference patterns within the tissues so they can literally just use light, the diffraction of that light, and then electronics to do incredible imaging feats. Hey everybody, welcome to Tech for Psych, where we combine the latest in neurotechnology with ancient wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm Dr. Cody Rawl, your medical doctor confidant. Today I wanted to talk about different pricing structures of brain imaging technology. It's a really interesting concept when you take a look at what's available to the individual consumer, what are research institutions using, what are uh, clinicians using, and how can we create an entry point for the general consumer into brain imaging. You know, we're using EEG for neurofeedback and attempting brain computer interface for it. Uh, there's online coming technology like uh, functional infrared spectroscopy. And then on the upper end, we have our big fancy CT and MRI scanners. So taking a look at what these things actually cost allows you to understand where our entry points are into using those technologies for various purposes to include neurofeedback, diagnosing uh, mental illness, using it for self-improvement, learning, um, and even brain-computer interface. So starting at the high end, you know, you have machines that are used for research institutions. And these could be one of a kind, trying to push the boundaries of imaging technology. And usually, right now, these are MRI machines or magnetic resonance imaging. And MRI machines require giant magnets to set up a magnetic field in the area of the body or the brain and then use radio pulses to cause the tissues to react to the radio pulses differently depending on the water content of the tissue. And that's why when you look at an MRI image, uh, bone looks different than the brain, that, which looks different than soft tissue, because each one of these tissues has a different water, water gradient in them. And all the fancy psychiatry, neuroscience, neurology, imaging studies are often done with MRI or functional MRI. Now functional MRI takes a look at oxygenated and deoxygenated blood flow. See when the neurons in the brain fire, they use up glucose and they need more blood flow to bring more fuel to the actual cells so they can fire again. So if you're activating different areas of the brain, the blood flow will react to the actual activation patterns of the brain and you can track that through functional MRI. And therein we start seeing what different areas of the brain are turning on at the same time and through our neuroscience studies can uh, hypothesize what actual circuits are in the brain. I've talked a lot about the default mode network as a circuit here on the brain. And that was seen by Dr. Marcus Rakeley and his team in 2001, then at University of Washington, when they put someone in an fMRI, fMRI scanner. Before they actually even started going through the cognitive tests, uh, they noticed that the people were laying there and having brain activation patterns. And what they realized is that it was self-referential thought. You know, what do we do when we're not doing anything? We start worrying about our, our problems, our worries, our tribulations, uh, going through self-rehearsal, self-stories about ourselves and that was activating the default mode network and they saw that with functional MRI. Now with these functional MRI machines they cost upwards of five million dollars at least. Um, a lot of the ones in clinics from what I know is like two or three million dollars or so. So obviously that's out of the price point of the general consumer. Uh, one person typically would not stand up and say I want to spend a couple million dollars on a functional MRI scanner so that I can investigate my own brain networks. I can see when my brain networks are activating when I'm playing an instrument or going through mathematic tasks or even using functional MRI for uh, neurofeedback purposes. And it has been used for neurofeedback practices. People have worked on that, but the cost is such a barrier. And a couple of uh, videos ago, I talked about the functional infrared spectroscopy machine 
uh, from Oblab and actually there was a lot of questions about how much that device actually cost. Well I will cut the tension here and tell you that that device that I put on my head costs anywhere from $35,000 to $50,000 and you're like what the heck that is not <laughs> an entry point for the general consumer to use. But that's why I want to frame out this talk in talking about price and how price actually comes down when devices become digitalized. And one of the best books that I've ever read on that subject, one of the only books that talks about that, is Peter Diamandis' Bold. And uh, his previous book, Abundance, talked about it as well. But what happens with technology when it becomes digitalized is that um, it becomes demonetized, then it, de then it dematerializes, then it becomes democratized. And I'll explain to you what that means. Now, let's, let's look at the pricing structure again. So you have a big fancy functional MRI machine that costs $5 million, or let's say $3.5 million. Then you have this Oblab near-infrared spectroscopy machine that costs $35,000. And the Oblab near-infrared spectroscopy machine tracks blood flow because what it does is use red light that scatters differently when it hits oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood in the, in the cortex of the brain and gives you information that a functional MRI machine would give you. And what's been happening in the research field is they are actually able to take data that they have gleaned from a couple of decades of functional MRI studies and start using them in functional infrared studies because they're tracking the same thing. They're tracking the blood flow in the brain and not only uh, confirming and collaborating between the two different studies but using what knowledge has been gained from fun functional MRI to inform functional near-infrared spectroscopy machines. So Oblab's device is very comparable to other functional near-infrared uh, spectroscopy um, uh, setups that are in research institutions. But what you see is those setups are a lot more cumbersome. They have all these wires. It's um, you know probably more, more flexible than Oblab's, but Oblab has definitely created something that is mobile, wireless, uh, connects to a tablet, and can be used very easily. Um, so comparative pricing structures, but really like moving towards what you would expect out of a wearable. And the point that I wanted to make on this video is that is a hundred fold price reduction, which is huge from 3.5 million to 35,000. Okay. So that's a start. And what's even more interesting is the device that Oblab has created is digitized. It's a digitized brain imaging device, which is huge because what happens when technology becomes digitized is that with our increasing computing power and reduction in price of computing power and then also computing memory, the price of those devices dramatically goes down year after year after year. And the example that Peter Diamandis gave in bold was of Kodak. Uh, Kodak company has been around for over 100 years. And uh, what I'm talking about is the camera company. And you know, they used to have these cameras that would uh, take the pictures and then you would have to take the camera to get the, the film developed at a Photoshop and then you have all your paper glossy photos. And a huge part of Kodak's revenue for so long was actually the paper that people were printing pictures on. And what's very interesting about Kodak is they actually had a digital camera developed in 1970s, like 1975. But they didn't see the potential in that digitalized project, that product, because what they saw is that um, that camera could only get a number of megapixels. And the number of megapixels they needed was much, much higher than what they expected would be able to be attained within a decade or two. And what happened is, as that digital technology improved, and digital cameras were able to hold more and more memory, get better and better optics, and improve over time, Kodak actually fell behind the curve, and before they knew it, they were filing for bankruptcy in the late 2000s because they uh, misunderstood the exponential increase in digitalized products. When cameras became digitalized, they demonetized, meaning they were much cheaper, and then they literally dematerialized. Every smartphone that we have now, by a large account, have cameras in them. 
um, you just buy a smartphone and then all of a sudden you have a very decent camera within it and we no longer needed to film because you can just upload the photos to Facebook or Instagram without needing to pay any money to actually show off your photos. So in that process, Kodak completely misread the uh, exponential increase in technology and went out of business. And what I'm advocating in brain imaging technologies, this is happening right now. The big magnetic re resonance imaging machines that have these big magnets, there's a lot of hardware in there that costs a lot of money to uh, purchase and maintain. But now that this imaging technology is becoming digitized in the form of near-infrared spectroscopy and EEG, these technologies are getting better and better as our computing speed, our optics, and our uh, computer chip technologies improve. So that's what's really exciting. And I talk about Oblab being at $35,000, but there are other alternatives for hemoencephalography, which is imaging of the blood flow of the brain by using uh, cheaper lasers and sensors. And I'm gonna have Josh Brewster here on the, the channel here pretty soon talking about a device that he's going to be selling called Duino for $50. And that's really what we're looking for, right? We're, we're looking for some kind of sweet spot in between you know, tens of thousands of dollars to thousands of dollars to within a couple of hundred dollars that the average consumer can enter in to using this type of technology to monitor the blood flow of their own brain so that they can use it for neurofeedback, meditation, uh, learning, all the things that I described before. That's really what we're working towards. And in my opinion, Oblab's device, they put in a ton of research, but it really is supply and demand because they put in a ton of research, a, a ton of development, but only research institutions are using that technology right now, meaning that there's very few buyers. So naturally to stay afloat, they have to charge a certain price. But when you look at what Mary Lou Jepsen is doing, and this is the, the final part of the talk that I wanted to uh, cover here, is that Mary Lou Jepsen has taken a look at this technology, and Mary Lou Jepsen is very familiar with uh, the concept of exponential technology. She's spoken at uh, Peter Diamandis' conferences and presented there. She's very aware that these components that are making up the infrared uh, spectroscopy devices can be mass produced by leveraging certain supply chains like in China. And this would dramatically bring down cost. And if it became common practice for consumers to be using near-infrared spectroscopy to image their bodies, to image their brains, uh, again, a massive price reduction would happen. And that's what we're aiming for here. That's what's coming. That's what's going to be developing here in the next five to 10 years is that technology. And when you look at Mary Lou Jepsen's website, Open Water, they already have imaging examples that have been gleaned from using their near-infrared spectroscopy device. Uh, they've developed new lasers, they've developed new sensors, they've developed uh, ultrasound technology that creates interference patterns within the tissues so they can literally just use light, the diffraction of that light, and then electronics to do incredible imaging feats. And What's really exciting is that as this technology gets better and better, yeah, we'll have technology hopefully within the couple hundred dollar to a thousand dollar range that uh, the average consumer can enter into to track blood flow of the brain. But not only that, we'll actually have imaging of the brain. There's no reason why you wouldn't be able to use that technology to actually see the brain. And Mary Lou Jepsen talks about even getting down to the level of a neuron. That is theoretically possible. So I think that what we'll be seeing here in the next half decade to a decade is a combination of technologies where you can see that hemoencephalography is being used to track blood flow for fMRI-like capabilities along with EEG and MEG where we are tracking the actual electrical impulses of the brain because using that you get a better overall picture. Blood flow of the brain gets better spatial resolution, meaning that you can see where it's happening better, but poorer temporal resolution because the blood flow happens after, a little bit after the fact of the neuron firing. So good spatial resolution, uh, less good so temporal resolution, but with EEG, really good temporal resolution, meaning that you uh, capture the event right when it happens, but poorer 
uh, spatial resolution, meaning that it's difficult to triangulate exactly where the electrical impulses are happening, put those two together, get a better comprehensive picture of what's going on in the brain. But once near-infrared spectroscopy or a different technology that we've not even learned about yet gets better, we can actually see with optical imaging the neuronal impulses, meaning we can see when the neuron actually fires. And that, my friends, is when we'll have ultimate spatial and temporal resolution, meaning that we can see the very neuron, we know exactly when it fires, we know where the neuron fires, and that's where you get high fidelity brain computer interface. Because if you can see how these neurons are behaving and uh, track when they are behaving, you can create an alphabet of the brain and be able to communicate to technology and to each other through thoughts. And that's a spooky thought, and that's years off, but as this technology gets better and better, that's really where we're headed. So, you know, it took me a little while to frame out that talk of exponential technology, but we took a look at how much an MRI machine actually costs, where Oblab is at, where people like Josh are developing low-cost alternatives, and taking a look at that mid-range where those EEG devices are within a couple hundred dollars, where Muse, Emotive, and Macrotelect are sell selling their devices within a couple hundred dollars for the consumers to enter into the realm of brain imaging. So we'll see a plethora of devices. I see uh, new designs, uh, new promotions coming out almost every week for a new device. It's, this field is taking off and I'm so excited to be on this journey with you guys and I'll continue to update this ch channel with any new developments that I see. And we'll have Josh here with his low alternative hemoencephalography device here pretty soon. I hope you enjoyed that Oblab video and I'm sorry to give you bad news that it's not just a couple hundred dollars that you can use, but uh, you know I wanted the world to be aware that that thing exists and to follow up with this video with some context, because if I would have said that it just cost $35,000, people may have been just like, well, why did you show it to us anyways? But I wanted to deliver this, this framework of that brain imaging technology is coming. We do have it in certain forms with EEG and low cost hemoencephalography alternatives and more devices are on the way. People are definitely working on it. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if this is the first time that you're here. And uh, this is Dr. Cody Rawls signing off. I'll talk to you again real soon.